Hi everyone and thank you very much for tuning in to our Next Generation E-Rally today. My name is Nicosia and I will be your moderator for this show. And I would like to introduce my panellists today, but I thought that to make it a little bit interesting, after you state your name and the constituency that you're standing in, tell us something about yourself that not many people know. Hi, I'm Raisa. I'm standing in Sengkang JRC. Um, a fact that not many people know is that I love fantasy books. And the first fantasy book was actually a make-your-own-adventure book um, that I still have today. Hi, my name is Fadli. I'm standing in Marine Parade GRC. Um, one fact that people don't know me is uh, I sport Tottenham Hotspurs, uh, a football club, and I sported it, started sporting it because I like the name. Uh, I'm such, I became such a big fan that I even went to uh, London to visit the old White Hart Lane. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Koh. I'm standing in Marine Parade GRC. One fact that not many people know is that I used to stutter. I used to stutter until I was 12 years old, and at that age, my uncle told me, Nat, you should think before you speak. And from then on, my stuttering improved and I stopped stuttering. Hi, my name is Gerald Giam. I'm running in Aljunit GRC. And one thing I know that no one knows about me is that I know all seven members of BTS. <laughs> now, I'm not a fan, but my wife and my daughter are members of the army. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for the introduction and a uh, shout out to the BTS Army at home. <laughs> Gerald has your back. Um, so let's kick off this session by um, hearing from Raisa. Uh, Raisa, you have a couple of thoughts um, on some of the key issues that are affecting youth in Singapore today. The world is unequivocally facing a climate crisis. Singapore is no exception. The projected rise in sea level threat threatens to flood our low-lying island nation. Warmer days will cause health problems for the young and old and increase occurrences of diseases, diseases such as dengue. Our water and food security are also at risk. Young Singaporeans today will bear the brunt of most of these problems tomorrow. By as early as 2045, temperatures could be high as 40 degrees daily. This is why we in the Workers' Party recognize the need to mitigate and adapt to climate change. That starts with our energy use. Singapore has a high carbon footprint per capita due to our economy's reliance on fossil fuels. We propose to reduce Singapore's reliance on fossil fuels by targeting 10% of our energy to come from renewable sources by 2025. We want to see an increase in the use of solar power and energy efficiency. There would also need to be an increase in transparency. Goal setting in the longer term to, for the share of renewables energy contribution to total energy production and data on emission trends should be published. This will increase awareness amongst the public and allow them to make comparisons against global standards. Responding to climate change will take more than just renewable energy and reducing emissions. It must be a whole of a nation approach. After all, climate change is not an isolated issue and is connected to social and economic developments. As we have seen during this pandemic, our reliance on food exports threatens food security when supply chains break down. Developing local industries not only reduces the amount of carbon expense in the process of food creation, but the resulting diversity in sources builds stronger food security. Addressing climate change would also provide opportunities for job creation and the growth of a more robust and ethical economy. Hence, we need to include a variety of stakeholders in this conversation, not only consumers, but also industries. This would allow for implementation of policies surrounding the use of green energy on an industrial level, creating more work opportunities, ultimately creating a green economy. Various Workers' Party MPs have spoken about climate change issues in Parliament, highlighting possible solutions such as protecting our natural environment, strengthening local farming, the adoption of research and development to fight diseases, and the sharing of climate change research. We in the Workers' Party believe in sustainable development that benefits the average Singaporean. The time to address climate change is now. Sebagai misi saya untuk meratakan ketidaksamaan antara remaja-remaja, saya sebagai sukarelawan 
memberi kelas tuition Inggeris kepada murid-murid dari keluarga yang pendapatan rendah yang sedang mengambil peperiksaan seperti peringkat N atau O. Kebanyakan anak remaja yang kami sokong mempunyai berbagai masalah kerana keadaan keluarga yang kurang stabil. Oleh kerana ini, ramai yang akan ketinggalan oleh sistem pelajaran, akses untuk peluang dan juga banyak berkurangan. Mereka bertentangan dengan banyak penghalang yang menghadkan untuk mereka dapat jalan keluar dari kitaran kemiskinan. But this story is not unique. It is one that you find across our nation. Today, too many Singaporeans have found themselves trapped in systems which hinder their ability to build a better life for themselves and their families. The current pandemic brings this into glaring focus. Vulnerable groups such as low-income families, people with disabilities, and senior citizens are disproportionately affected. This is particularly true where they work in professions with few safety nets and insufficient income and job protection, which is a common occurrence. Stark disparities in digital literacy and access to IT facilities have also surfaced, which in turn worsens inequality. The Workers' Party believes in giving a firm helping hand to help those who are willing to help themselves. We have called for a skills future education lo loan dispersing zero interest loans from the state to support the cost of continuing education and training programs and qualifications. We know that there are various options on the skills future schemes for grants that support the cost of deep specialized training in specific skills, but these awards are highly limited and very competitive. Furthermore, existing loans from banks are subject to credit checks and commercial interest rates, which may make them less accessible to applicants from low-income backgrounds. This loan, readily available, would allow for non-competitive and more widespread access to funding, unlocking opportunities to those who seek it. To nudge prospective students into high-potential industries, the granting of such loans can be calibrated towards high-growth industries with a lack of Singaporean manpower. But this is one policy proposal we this is but one policy proposal we have in our manifesto. I invite you to learn more. I believe that by coming together, Singapore can take the crucial steps in solving these problems. The Workers' Party has fought to lessen inequality in the past. We ask you send us to Parliament to continue this fight. Make your vote count. So, Raisa, um, in your speech earlier, you know, you spoke so passionately about climate change and we also know that it's something that you've been advocating for a very long time. So, I just want to throw the question out to the rest of the panellists here. Uh, do you all think that, you know, climate change will continue to remain a key topic even in a post-COVID-19 world? Well, I would, I would say that COVID-19 has not actually changed the climate change issue. It's still very relevant to us. In fact, for Singapore, it's even more relevant now than ever before because Singapore is a very low-lying country and climate change will cause sea levels to rise and, and the rising sea levels will affect us as in Singapore. And uh, in terms of COVID-19 and how, climate, how, how it affects climate change, I think it would actually, in some ways, help to accelerate the, the move towards less emissions and, and less travel because with telecommuting and teleconferencing being no, the norm nowadays, I think that's where we will see a reduction in air travel, reduction in in the road travel, and that would reduce our emissions in, in the country. So I think that's a good thing sometimes. Okay, so Gerald, you've provided an environmental perspective on this, but I think in some quarters, when we talk about climate change, uh, there's always the issue of class that comes in as well. Uh, Raisa, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, in the past, the conversations around climate change are focused on the consumer. Um, but I think we're, we're seeing a shift from um, the burden being on the consumer to being on industries, which I think is a positive shift in this country. So, you know, hot topics like climate change, COVID-19, at, at the end of the day, they do tend to cast a lens on um, inequality as a whole. So I thought uh, perhaps we can talk about how inequality has been magnified during this period. And do you think that it's something that we can resolve? Perhaps we could hear from you, Ned. Yeah. I think inequality has always been around in, in Singapore society for a very long time. And one of the key things which I observed during my Meet the People sessions is that there are residents who are 
who are, low, who are from low-income families, and they have young children who are going to attend primary school. And there are times when, for some reason or other, due to housing circumstances, for example, their, their child is placed in a primary school that is far from their home. Now, some of you may think that why not just take public transport? Why not just take the school bus? But the fact is that they are low income. Every cent matters. Public transport costs money. School bus costs money. So how do we reduce that situation? How do we improve that, that situation where we, have, where we have these low income families have their children placed in, placed in a school that is nearer their home so that they can reduce their cost of even travelling to school. So it's so interesting that there are all these unseen factors that lie below the surface that do contribute in a way to the effectiveness and the quality of education that children receive, even though they're all going to perhaps what we call the sim similar schools in that sense. So um, I'm thinking with regards to uh, schooling, obviously we will then talk about home-based learning, which was a hot topic during COVID-19 with a lot of parents being made to stay at home and teach their kids. Uh, Fadli, perhaps you'd like to share your perspective on this. Do you think that inequality has been exacerbated uh, during the whole process of home-based learning? Yes, uh, I would like for the first uh, build upon what Ned has uh, raised, that uh, as, much, as good as our formal systems of education are, uh, we should also think about the informal social, social ecology which uh, affects young kids and which the young kids live in. For, for example, uh, a, a child living in a bigger family uh, might have no room to study or think or, or, or even um, do their homework. So that is one aspect in which home-based learning has, exp has exposed the inequalities. Also, we, have, we also hear of problems with technology, that s children have problems uh, connecting even to the internet, where the houses don't have wireless access. So uh, all these issues arise because of COVID, and we need to look at uh, education beyond the formal schooling system and more towards the informal ecology itself. Thanks so much, Padli. So I think right now we're going to move to our next speech. Uh, we have Tan Chen Chen, who is our Pongol West SMC candidate, and she will touch on a topic that many of us are familiar with, public housing. Hello, 例如政府主屋的价格，对于刚踏入社会的年轻人来说是非常重要的。我跟我的丈夫在二零一八年申请了政府主屋，我们都工作了十多年，但是没有办法全额支付一套在非成熟地区较大型的政府主屋。对刚
Ned, you've gotten your place not too long ago. Um, do you have any observations on the pricing of BTO flats? Yes, Nicole, I do have some observations on the pricing of BTO flats. The large segment of BTO flats are in non-mature estates. And we have to understand that in 2017, how the government mentioned that there were two criteria in setting BTO flat prices in non-mature estates. The first criteria is the resale prices of the resale flats in the vicinity. And the second criteria is the attributes of the new flat. Now, the government also mentioned that they are committed to making those flats affordable. The challenge here is this. The challenge here is that how can we ensure that this commitment to affordability is sustainable? Because you look at it, the commitment, commitment is subjective. How can we make it more objective? Because a more objective criteria will be sustainable in the long run. And how we can make it more objective is to base BTO flat prices, especially in non-mature estates, on the median monthly household income of Singaporeans. And I think that objective criteria will make affordability more sustainable in the long term. Understood. So what you're saying is that if we're talking about public housing and going back to the ethos of it, then instead of pegging it to free market forces like the price of resale flats in the same vicinity, we then need to start looking at um, pegging it to monthly household incomes instead. And I think that will make a huge difference in adjusting the cost. But in the meantime, uh, the situation is what it is. Uh, so I think it's always going to be a matter of a uh, cost of living that is um, exacerbated as a result of us having to pay so much for the HDB flats that we live in. So perhaps, um, you know, Gerald, you're, you're a father and you've been through that phase before. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, you see, I got married relatively early by Singapore standards. I was 26 years old when I got married. And at that time, uh, we were looking for a flat, but it was very, a bit hard to, for us to find a flat that was aff affordable because I was just starting out on my career and I wasn't earning very much, neither was my wife. Uh, but fortunately, that was back in 2003 when the prices of flats were much lower than they are now. So I was able to find some place that was kind of uh, far out from the city, cen city centre, but it was good enough for us. Uh, I think couples have it a bit harder nowadays uh, because the prices have gone up quite a bit. And um, the problem with, with uh, very expensive flats is that couples would end up delaying their marriage because they don't want to get married so early because they can't afford to find a flat right away. And so they delay marriage and that has a knock-on effect on things like childbearing because they will have children a bit later. If they have children a bit later, it means that they, are, they might have fewer children or no children at all. So that becomes a problem when we are dealing with a fertility crisis as well in Singapore. You know, I, I thought it was so interesting that at the heart of it, and when you look at face value, it seems like it's just a public housing issue, but that actually has a ripple effect on so many facets of society, and then it trickles down to our abilities to start a family and all. Um, that's it, you know, we do also acknowledge that uh, the housing policy has always been skewed towards the favour of um, couples who choose to get married before a certain age. Um, and I think we need to recognise that there are other segments of society who would also be in need of their own type of public housing. So uh, perhaps, you know, then I will ask Fadli, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Apart from families, like, well, who else do you think might be in need of public housing and do you think the current policies work? Well, I think that uh, the other group that needs public housing are, of course, of course, young adults. And the importance of giving young adults the access to public housing is uh, twofold. The first aspect is the aspect of the development of the young adults. Once you buy your own house, you are more, uh, you are more able to make your own decisions. You can take responsibility for yourself and you begin to chart your own uh, future. So, uh, in terms of personal development, uh, having access to public housing is crucial for the development of the individual. The second aspect is the aspect of the development of society. Now, what I mean by this is buying a house is not just buying a piece of, pro piece of property or land. It's about buying a stake in the country. So the earlier that the individual can buy a stake in the country, the earlier the person can sink roots in the, into the country. So it is in our interest to ensure that our young adults are invested in our country at an early age.
So when we're talking about um, you know, empowering youth at a younger age to own their own place, uh, that obviously has knock-on effects on um, their ownership within uh, Singapore society. And I think it's a good time for us to then segue into politics. So let's talk about youth in politics. Uh, you know, I think this GE 2020 has been a particularly interesting one for us uh, because we start to see more candidates below the age of 30 years old who are stepping up to the plate. And one of them is our very own Raisa. Uh, so Raisa, you are the youngest candidate in WP. How has your experience been so far? Um, so it's definitely been interesting. I'm constantly in, in rooms full of people with resumes that are like 10 pages long um, and, you know, have really valuable experience. But um, what I'd like to say is that all experiences matter, um, and youth experiences matter as well. We are stakeholders in this country, and we deserve to be part of all decision-making processes. I believe that with more involvement of youth, um, policies in this country will change for the better. And I think that there are places for us um, in the political system. And this election that we have recognised is an uphill battle. So um, I believe that as youths go to the ballot box, uh, they're going to be asking this question and they're going to be reflecting on it. What can the Workers' Party offer to voters and why should we vote the Workers' Party into Parliament? Uh, this is where we hear from our Marine Parade GRC candidate, Ron Tan, who will share his thoughts on this from a macro perspective. My friends, with the nation building by our pioneer and Medeca generations, Singapore has become a developed economy. However, have we gone far enough in building a democratic society as one united people? We have much work to do in that regard. A democratic society means that equal treatment under the law is assured for everyone. The active participation of the people as citizens in politics and their community engagements most importantly, citizens of a democratic society have the right to vote, to elect their representatives. Having a credible opposition such as the Workers' Party in Parliament exercises the motion of a resilient democracy. We create room for robust, respectful debate with a diversity of views in Parliament. This creates a healthier political landscape for Singapore. For instance, with redundancy becoming more common, even before the onset of COVID-19, the Workers' Party pushed hard for the workers in Parliament. We pushed for redundancy insurance to safeguard us in increasingly uncertain times. The Workers' Party guards against encroachment of our free speech and recognises the power of fake news. We voted against POFMA in 2019 because we believe that it is a cure worse than the disease of fake news. My colleagues and I believe that media reform is long overdue. This equalizes the political playing field, as well as allow greater freedom of speech, subject to proper fact-checking, of course. When the media is protective of the government, when the voices of the people are being censored and or tuned up, we lack even the pretext of justice and equality of a democratic society. No wonder Singapore is ranked 158th in the 2020 World Press Freedom Index. The Workers' Party cannot do all the work to build our democratic society ourselves. With so many young Singaporeans stepping up to take on more responsibilities and be the voice speaking up for their seniors, their cohort and their children, we call upon our youth to go one step further and join us in our journey. Make your vote count. Vote the Workers' Party. I believe 因为老年人、同龄人和孩子们大眼 使新加坡人民有了集体意识, 
，才能随机修订，以期良效。人民的心音，人民的心声，是最大的力量。让政政府知道政策的好坏，才对国人最有益。国会里多一些工党的成员，有助于把我们声音带入国会，让政府听到我们的心声。请投工人党一票。让您的一票成就未来，谢谢。Ron mentioned、um, the importance of having a diverse set of views in Parliament, and I thought,、uh, who better else to hear from than a former NCMP?、Uh, General, you've been an NCMP before, and、uh, obviously you're very familiar with the workings of、uh, Parliament.、Uh, would you be able to share, in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest difference between an NCMP and an elected MP? We're also aware that、um, you know, in recent days, the government has encouraged voters,、um, you know, not to vote for the opposition, telling them that you know they would be. As、they would be able to get an NCMP seat instead. So,、uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think voters should not be swayed by that argument. We have elections for a purpose. It's also also to give people a choice on whether to, they want to vote for the government or the opposition.、Um, the important point to note is that P- the parliament is not just a talk shop. It's not a place where P- MPs just give speeches and sit down. It's really a place. the The primary purpose is a place where MPs will vote on laws. And so, to vote on laws, you need the numbers. And right now, if the PAP feels very comfortable with its two-thirds majority, it will, it will be there. There will be much hard. It will be much harder for them to be a responsive government. But when they see that their two-thirds majority is being eroded, that's when they will be much more responsive, and that's where they'll listen to your concerns a lot more. And so, as far as NCMPs is con- are concerned, it's very hard for NCMPs to be able to sink roots into the constituency because they have no constituency, and it's very hard for them to. To get real feedback from residents, like say through meet the people sessions, because they don't have those sessions. Now that we've spoken about、uh, Parliament and why it's important to have fully elected MPs and not just NCMPs,、uh, we can also then trickle down into other aspects of society.、Um, Ned, you've also had a speech where、uh, you know we talk about the different areas of society that、uh, would change、uh, as a result of a greater acceptance towards diverse views. The pledge. We said it every day when we were in school, but how many of us really knew what the words meant? How many of us knew what we meant when we said the words to build a democratic society based on justice and equality? I believe many of your children, our students, may not truly feel and understand the meaning of the pledge. Perhaps even some adults may not understand fully as well. I read a report that the government released three years ago. The report aimed to refresh the way national education was taught. Can you guess how many times the pledge was stated in the report? Just once, and it was under the category called daily routines. Our national pledge has been reduced to a daily routine. That must change. We can change that by making the pledge a key part of national education. We can start by teaching our children what it means to live in a democratic society, a society based on justice and equality. We can teach our children. What it means to vote, what it means to govern, and what it means to have a check and balance in parliament. But you may ask, why is that necessary? Shouldn't we just focus on English, math, and science? My friends, democracy is a value we must hold dear. Doing democracy right from young means that we, the citizens, know we can participate meaningfully in the running of our nation. We can make that difference. Let's have our pledge bring meaning to our children. Let's put our pledge at the forefront of national education. Let's start by guiding our children. 
to build a democratic society based on justice and equality. Let Singapore be a place where democracy thrives, where every vote truly means something. Make your vote count. Vote for the Workers' Party. Ned, uh, just now in your speech, you covered a whole range of topics, you know, measures that we need to gain a wider acceptance of diverse views in society, from lowering voting age to even changing the way we run national education. But the one interesting thing that I thought you spoke about uh, was media. And I think some people might argue um, against this to say that uh, it, actually right now in Singapore, we do have quite a number of publications out there that publish alternative views and they purport that these help to balance the conversation. But I think the question that we have here is that, is that really the case, you know? Uh, Fadi, what, what do you think about that? Well, I do not agree that, they, that the uh, playing field is balanced for online media because you need to remember that online media is funded mainly by donations and by volunteers. So they lack the kind of reach and resources which mainstream established media has, uh, such as the Straits Times. So uh, when we say that it's balanced, uh, I think we need to look closer at the kind of resources and reach that the two different outlets can deploy. And you're looking at two things here, right, when we talk about media. So you're talking about the deep pockets that they have, and you're also talking about a certain inclination that they have. And I think altogether, that makes it a perfect recipe for a very unequal playing field. Uh, so, Ned, you know, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. So already, Singaporeans can see the short parliamentary clips on TV, on YouTube, and they see empty seats in Parliament. But what they don't see is that most if not all, the Workers' Party MPs are there almost all the time in Parliament. And sometimes I believe they may outnumber the PAP MPs at certain times. And also what they don't see is the robust debate that our Workers' Party MPs have with the PAP MPs at times. So how we can improve that is to broadcast parliamentary proceedings live. And in that way, Singaporeans can see how seriously Workers' Party MPs take their parliamentary duties. I, I totally agree with you on that. I think apart from media, it would be really interesting for us to talk about national education as well. Um, Raisa, you know, personally, because you're the youngest amongst all of us, probably the closest um, to uh, schooling years as well. Um, you know, when you were back in school, uh, did you feel that you had the opportunity to participate in such discussions freely? You know, and were you allowed to have, uh, you know, diverse views in that sense? Yeah, actually, an interesting part of my childhood was that I, I, I moved from different um, education systems. Mm -hmm. So I moved from um, international system to local, international, local, back again. Um, and what I remember was how stifled I felt in the local system. So I really felt like I couldn't express myself and that my voice wasn't heard. So I, I, I really feel that in schools, we need to cultivate things like critical thinking, which is important. Um, you know, in, in allowing children to express themselves and also actually has positive repercussions for our economy. Um, I think we should also um, enable our, our, our children, the children of our generation, to learn about the different political systems, especially the political system here, because they're our future voters. Um, and, and, you know, they should be empowered to, to make um, wise political decisions. And actually, um, I, I personally believe that you can never start too young. So um, one of my 11-month-old uh, favorite book is called um, Activism is for Everyone. <laughs> so nice. yeah, so uh, the, the alphabet of activism or something like that. Um, and so yeah, I, I firmly believe that um, we really need to expose our children to, to these things. I love that. You're going to have to tell me where to buy that book for my daughter as well. Okay, so um, thank you everyone so much for your insights today. I think we had a really great discussion here. We're now going into our very last segment where we do what we call an elevator pitch. Uh, so for all of you here, imagine that you've walked into a lift and you're, sitting, you're standing there with a voter uh, who has absolutely no inclination, um, you know, on the fence, doesn't really know what WP does or what WP stands for. Uh, you know, what would you say to this person to convince this person to vote the Workers' Party into Parliament? Well, I would say that to remember that Singapore is bigger than just one party. We know this to be true now and we need it to be true in the future. So no party has a monopoly on wisdom or truth. 
and we need more voices in Parliament to bring a wider spectrum of views. If you believe that people should be able to live with dignity and have access to decent work, if you believe that everyone in this country should be able to reach their full potential, then vote the Workers' Party. With more Workers' Party MPs in Parliament, you will see a more balanced Parliament and we'll have more discussions on policies that matter to you. So make your vote count this election. Hi there. Which telco do you use? Singtel, M1, Starhub, My Republic, TPG? Not an advertisement. <laughs> you know, with more choices, you get what? Two things. Lower cost, better service. The same thing happens when you have more Workers' Party MPs in Parliament. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so we've heard from uh, a closet uh, BTS fan as well as a, a, a challenger telco subscriber today. <laughs> So uh, I just want to thank everyone again for your thoughts. Uh, I think this was a great discussion. And I do want to thank our voters at home uh, for watching us all the way to the end. Um, and I hope that you have learned more about the Workers' Party and where our position is with regards to younger voters. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, we still have a couple of days left to the end of uh, to the end of the hustings. So feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or Facebook if you have any questions or you have any issues that you would like to raise. Um, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and I'd like to remind all of you to make your vote count and vote for the Workers' Party. Thank you. Yeah.